Amen. Good morning. Welcome to Burns Memorial United Methodist Church. It's great to see you all here. Welcome to the many who are joining us via the live stream today. It looks like more than usual joining us via live stream today. Our call to worship is from Psalm 118. Would you stand, please? I'll read the light print if you all read the dark print together. This is the day that the Lord hath made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. And his mercy endures forever. Amen. And let us pray together. Dear Lord, we celebrate you today and are thankful for this Sunday as it comes. We're thankful for the chance to sing your praises and to be with your people. And to know once more, to be reminded once more that you are our God and that we belong to you. Bless this hour of worship for us who are here and for all who are gathering in other places today. Bless us as we seek you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. There we go. And as you remain standing, could you join us as we sing, Crown Him with Many Crowns. Amen. And as you remain standing, let us. Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From then she shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy universal church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. 
And then before taking your seat, if you reach across the aisle and smile and greet two or three people, somebody with a different last name than you have. the family of God. Good morning again. And as you have greeted your neighbors, your friends, co-workers, workers, family, and church members, now is the news of the week. The first one is kind of interesting to me. The United Methodist men, you know, we're meeting tomorrow. Normally we would have on that pork chops, you know, real mashed potatoes and green beans, all of this. But here's a kick or a catch for tomorrow. It's a TBD, or to be determined. <laughs> the meat of the day, we don't know. What veggie we're having, I don't know. But, uh, you know, we will have uh, something to eat and a dessert. So that, that's the best way to put that one. So, yeah. Come for those of you that are interested to find out what it is, men, you're welcome to join us. All right, also, for the rest of the week, Augusta Gardens is at uh, 10 o'clock on Tuesday. The Latane Kirkley Circle at 1 o'clock on Tuesday afternoon. There's a makeup breakfast club meeting at Roots on Tuesday at 8 in the morning. The Wednesday morning Bible study, 10 o'clock, Zoom. And there's one more I'm supposed to announce. I can't remember what it is, but I'm sure it'll come to me before the end of it. But anyway, just in case I forget. God is good. All the time. And all the time. God is good. Amen. Well, I got a song? Yes, I do have a song. And as you remain seated and join us as we sing in the garden. Joy we share 
as we tarry there, none other has ever known. I'd stay in the garden with him through the night. Just a second. Um, the refrain. I don't know, something just hit me. What I'd like for y'all to do is just close your eyes. Just close your eyes and sing the refrain. And he walks with me. Just close your eyes and sing it. And he walks. And sing it like you mean it. Like you're sitting there and looking at it. And he tells me I am his own And the joy we share as we tarry there None other has ever known Thank you. Hey Amen, that's a good, good way to do it, Bruce. I had never thought about it, doing it like that with the eyes closed, but it does make it, make it more personal. Uh, before we pray today, we're going to have a short clip, a video clip called My Shepherd. And it's kind of like what we just did with the, with the uh, In the Garden hymn. It's just a reminder that, that we have one who loves us, who cares for us. I know this is a tense and, and uh, uh, stressful world we live in with wars in Europe and, and stress in our country. And a lot of people find comfort in reminding themselves that God is their shepherd. Let's do the video. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And let's bow our heads and, and go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, as we pause here, we lift up the, the concerns of our hearts, the things we worry about, worries we have for our children and, and parents, and concerns we have for friends and our own concerns, Lord, the the stresses and intentions of our life, we lift up to you. We are reminded, Heavenly Father, that you are our shepherd. And that even with wars in the world, even with, with financial challenges and work challenges and whatever relationship challenges, whatever we're going through, pains of aging health issues, whatever we're going through, Lord, we know that you're still our shepherd. And that your presence is always with us, that you guide us, that you comfort us, that even in the dark moments that you walk with us there. Lord, as we worship you today, we pray that you renew our sense of your presence in our lives. And our realization, dear Lord, that we are sheep in your pasture. In other words, that you are the one in charge and that we're here to follow and to trust and to know that you have a plan. 
Dear Lord, we lift up these concerns to you today, and we pray too, Heavenly Father, for, for the people around the world who need to know especially your comfort and direction. We lift up again uh, Russia and Ukraine. We pray for our country here and the leaders here. We pray for our church leaders and our, our leaders of this congregation. Lord, help us to find more ways to live out your commandments and ways to live out your commandments more authentically, that we might indeed love you with heart and mind and soul and strength and indeed love our neighbors as ourselves. Lord, help us to be the church that you want us to be. We pray all this in the name of the Christ, the one who taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
to, as our choir is going back, I just, uh, Bruce didn't mention, we had a lot of great pictures on the back from last Sunday, the uh, Easter Sunday uh, sunrise service. We had a lot of people there, and then Nathan and Carl, and I think some other folks might maybe cooked us some pancakes and, and sausage, and, and uh, a good time was had by all. And after that, we had the Easter egg hunt. We have some of the kids, some of the parents here, uh, had their kids here for the Easter egg hunt. And what else? And the crosswalk picture. I think that might be the largest community event that we host all year. Uh, there were uh, more than 100, probably several hundred people here in the crosswalk on Good Friday. And so we always uh, look forward. They always invite us to host that. We always appreciate the opportunity. And also, we thank everybody who uh, uh, brought in flowers. This is the first year, you know, Easter week got really busy. And the first year that Lori and I had not brought flowers for the Easter cross. And, and so we are so thankful that many of y'all did. And, and uh, then took the time to come up and, and decorate them, so decorate the cross so much. And we appreciate that. The scripture today is from the book of uh, Acts chapter 5. Would you stand, please, for reading of God's word? I'm just going to read the uh, 5 verses 29 through 32. Peter and John have been brought in before the Sanhedrin to explain why they are talking about Jesus. They've been commanded not to talk about Jesus. And Peter responds. But Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than man. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you murdered by hanging on a tree. Him God has exalted to his right hand to be prince and savior, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses to these things. And so also is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, to, be God. to God. Please be seated. One of the things that surprised me about the Easter stories that always seems, seems uh, uh, unusual is how surprised everybody is that Jesus is back. And you, you remember last week in the narrative, in the, the God reading from the beginning of Luke, the uh, disciples thought that the women who saw Jesus and saw the angels were just spreading idle tales, and they didn't believe. In fact, some of them didn't believe so much that they leave. And that's the second part of that Luke 24, where Jesus meets those on the Emmaus walk. And so I've wondered about the uh, skepticism and what it would be like to talk to a skeptic today, somebody who doesn't believe in the risen Lord. So uh, we have a, a narrative today uh, with a Christian and a skeptic, and our narrator is going to start us off. Imagine it is a Monday morning. A little bit louder, Tom. Imagine it is a Monday morning, the Monday after Easter Sunday. And one person's whistling leads to a chance conversation that could change a person's life forever. about today oh I'm sorry sometimes I get a, a song in my head from Sunday and the words just kind of the song just stays there this is the, the words of this are he lives he lives Christ Jesus lives today he walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way you ask me how I know he lives he lives within my heart hmm you know this whole Jesus thing it's a myth there's no such person and there was, uh, if there was, should I say, he didn't die and then rise up again. You know, once you did, you did. You know, killed is killed, dead is dead. So, you know, there's, there's no coming back. Well, that sounds like a sad way to look at the world. Reality is depressing. And Christianity is like a make-believe, like Grimm's fairy tale, once upon a time. Or like George... It's fantasy. A long time ago in a far, far away place, 
or something like Stan Lee wrote. Like Spider-Man, Jesus might be a fun story, just not true. Well, there's one big difference between Jesus and Spider-Man. What? No way. Uh, <laughs> I was thinking that, that uh, Jesus is a real person. Uh, his story happened in real history. In an uh, ancient creed that we say often in church, Jesus is mentioned in the same context as somebody named Pontius Pilate. He's just another made-up person. Now, actually, actually, Pilate's a historical person. It's kind of cool. In, in Jesus' day, the Roman military for the region was based in the Mediterranean coast in a town named Caesarea, and they were doing excavations there not long ago, and they found a damaged block of carved limestone that had a partially intact uh, inscription that read to the divine Augustus from Pontius Pilate, perfect Ju of Judea, and has dedicated, and the rest is broken off. But evidently Pilate had built something and, and dedicated it to the emperor Augustus. By the way, the perfect is a term for a governor of an area, and Pontius Pilate was the governor of Judea from 26 to 36, He's also mentioned by historians of the time, somebody named Josephus and a writer named Philo and a Roman historian named Tactus. So what? Well, I was just saying that the Jesus story is set in real, real history. You don't find Luke Skywalker's name on a 2,000 year old brick. Hmm. Just like one person. I know he's just one person, but there are other historical figures throughout the Bible. It says in the Gospels that Jesus was born in the days of Herod the King and Caesar Augustus. Both of these are real people. Herod, you know, is famous for having built that city that Pilate was at, Caesarea, and naming it for his patron Caesar. He also built fortresses at the Herodian and Masada. Uh, the forts are now in ruins, but they were there. It's, this is real, real history. Well, okay, you might have a, myth a mythological person set in history, but that's what you call historical fiction. But, but Jesus is historical too. He's named in many places, including two ancient historians who weren't Christians. Josephus, uh, the Jew who writes of Jesus' crucifixion and says if some of the people thought he was the Messiah, and a Roman senator and historian named Tactus, who wrote of the group called Christians and that they were named for someone named Christus, who was killed by one of the uh, pilot, one of the uh, perfects, Pontius Pilate. Tactus is not a Christian, and he'd have no reason to make it up. So Jesus was a real person. He lived where and when the Bible said he did. Okay, all right. So, but even if it was real, there's no reason to think that he rose from the dead. Well, there are some reasons. There are some reasons. Like what? Well, you know, Christianity grew up right where Jesus was killed, right? So? So, well, that would be the easiest place to disprove Christianity. He'd been publicly killed. It would, it would take an awful lot for people there who had seen him die to believe that he rose again and all you would have to do to disprove it would be to produce Jesus dead body it must have been hidden well that's what the skeptic said then too and then there's the disciples what about them well you know they had trouble believing they were sure that dead is dead too and and like you and and in the days after the crucifixion his two leading disciples Peter and John they were not at the tomb looking for the resurrection. No, they're, they're in Jerusalem hiding in a locked house. And when a woman named Mary goes to the tomb, and, and she's there also not looking for the risen Lord, she's there to grieve, and she's surprised by seeing Jesus alive. And at first mistakes the risen Christ for the gardener. She says, where did you put his body? And Jesus spoke to her and called her by name, and her eyes were open, and she saw that it was Christ, and she went to tell the disciples, but when she told them, they still didn't believe her. So what made the disciples finally believe? Well, Jesus appeared to them too. They were gathered and all of a sudden he was there with them and he said, peace be with you. He said, my peace I give to you. 
And, and even though he said that, they were terrified. They thought they were seeing a ghost. Jesus said, why are you so afraid and full of doubt? Look at my hands and my feet. It's myself. Touch me. A ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. Did they believe then? Uh, well, not yet. Some of them still were, had doubt in their eyes, so Jesus asked if they had anything to eat. And they gave him a piece of world fish. And I think he was still showing that he wasn't a ghost and he ate it in their presence. But one disciple was missing. And he said when he heard about the rest, he said he wasn't going to believe until he saw for himself and put his own hands in Jesus' side. And a week later, Jesus was there. And you know what he asked this disciple to do? Touch his side. That's right. And Jesus said, uh, Thomas, you believe because you have seen me. Blessed are those who believe without seeing me. Well, they could have been making the whole thing else. You know, the whole thing up. But, you know, a lie doesn't care who tell it. But why would the disciples lie? What's in it for them? Fame and fortune. They can claim they saw the risen Jesus. But they didn't get fame and fortune. As they shared the good news, they were persecuted they were arrested, and eventually most or all the disciples were executed for their faith. When Peter was executed, he said, I'm not worthy to be crucified as my Lord, and asked to be crucified upside down. Why die for a lie? Is that all you got? No, uh, no, they're the predictions. Predictions? Predictions, the, the prophecies. Uh, Jesus knew that he's going to be killed, and he told his disciples about it beforehand. Listen to this from Luke chapter 18. Jesus took his 12 disciples aside and said to them, Behold, we're going up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man will be accomplished. He will be delivered to the Gentiles and will be mocked and insulted and spit upon. They will scourge him and kill him. The third day he will rise again. In that short passage, Jesus predicts seven details of his arrest and trial and death and resurrection. The disciples did not want to listen to him at the time, but it made sense later on. Several times in each of the Gospels, Jesus predicts what will happen in Jerusalem, and sometimes he doesn't predict it so clearly, he just hints at it. What do you mean, hints? Oh, one time, one time that the religious leaders asked for a sign, and Jesus says, the only sign they're going to get is going to be the sign of Jonah. You remember the story of Jonah? In the Old Testament, he was swallowed by a well and given up for dead and was in the belly of the well for three days and three nights and then was spit out onto the beach. Jesus was saying by the sign of, of Jonah that he too will be three days and three nights in the tomb before coming back again. Well, if he knew what was coming, why did he go to Jerusalem in the first place? To die for our sins. To do what? Sins? Yeah, sins refers to things that we have done that we should not have done or things that we, we should have done that we haven't done. We've all fallen short of what God would have us be. Okay, wait a minute. So how does Jesus' death help with this? The sacrifice of Christ is sufficient for the sins of the whole world. Why? Because Jesus is, was, always is the Son of God. And his sacrifice as deity, as God, was enough to cover the sins of all of humanity. Jesus said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not die, but have everlasting life. <laughs> Boy, you really did drink the Kool-Aid, didn't you? You wrote the, you know, you know the church wrote the New Testament. And they could put anything in it that they wanted to. Well, that's true. The, the New Testament, the Gospels are written by believers. Two were probably written by original disciples, Matthew and John. Mark is thought to have been, uh, been Peter's Gospel. Uh, Peter was thought to have been illiterate and that he dictated his story to Mark. And the Gospel of Luke, of course, Luke isn't a witness, but he interviews people. In the first paragraph of Luke, he says he made a a careful investigation, investigation and talk to the eyewitnesses. But you know, there's other evidence other than the New Testament. Jesus points to it. 
Like where? Like the Old Testament. You know, the Old Testament was completed hundreds of years before the time of Jesus. Copies of all, of almost all the books of the Old Testament are found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. But in the Old Testament, written long before Jesus, there are passages that sound like they're describing Jesus. Like where? Well, like, like Isaiah 53. The prophet wrote, Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each one of us have turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. You know, that suffering sounds like Jesus. Well, if it talks about a man sacrificing himself, which it does, but it doesn't say that he will rise again. Well, Isaiah 53, despite all that, it ends in praise. And so the idea of Isaiah 53 is that good wins in the end. But there are a lot of other passages. There's Psalm 16, which the disciples quote often after the resurrection. Psalm 16, where the psalmist says, Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body will also rest secure because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see, de see decay. You have made known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. <laughs> this is getting too complicated. My head is starting to hurt. So let's cut to the chase. Why do you really believe in the resurrection? Well, I see Jesus' story as part of the larger biblical story. The Bible is a story of God creating the universe and God interacting with humanity, teaching humanity, sacrificing for humanity, and God, out of love, preparing an eternal home for humanity. And there are miracles all through the Bible. I see Jesus' resurrection as the greatest miracle, but as one of thousands of miracles in the Bible. And it seems to me that if God can create the world, if God can create life, that God can certainly restore life when God chooses to. But what if it's all made up? Well, what if it is? What if it were all made up? Then Christians lead hopeful lives, uh, happy and hopeful with the hope of everlasting life. And if it's, if it's made up, what have we lost? If it isn't made up and you reject eternal life, you're rejecting hope now and hope of eternal life to come. You know, there's a famous mathematician who called Christianity, because of this, he called Christianity a good bet. What do you mean? Well, there's a man named Pascal, Blaise Pascal, who, who made uh, discoveries in geometry. He invented a calculating machine. There's a computer language name for him, Pascal. He made discoveries in physics and proved the existence of the vacuum. He paved the way for the hypodermic syringe and barometers and hydraulic devices. Pascal also came up with the mathematical theory of probability and helped shape the field of calculus. He's also, funny as it is, he's supposed to be the first person to invent the wristwatch. He got tired of looking in his pocket for it, see what time it is. Okay, okay. So he was a smart guy. But what does this have to do with believing in the resurrection? Well, Blaise Pascal was also a Christian. And he wrote that a rational person should live as though God exists and seek to believe in God. If God does not exist, such a person will only have finite losses. Whereas if God does exist, he stands to relieve, receive infinite gains and avoid infinite losses. Any more evidence? Well, Pascal said that, and this is interesting for a scientist to say it, he said that we come to know truth not just by reason, but we, we come to truth through our hearts, through what we sense on the inside. I asked my dad one time when I was in high school why he believed in the resurrection, and he answered me by talking about his heart. He started by quoting the song. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives salvation to in part. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. Mm. So, 
Let me get this right. So Jesus lives in your heart. Yes, he does. And he could live in, in your heart as well. A Christian and a skeptic met, talked about Jesus, went to worship services together, and then there were two Christians. The disciple Peter wrote, always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you for a reason. For that hope is in you. If somebody asks you, why do you believe, what do you say? Appreciate it, Bruce and, and Thomas. That's our sermon today. Sometimes it seems uh, better to work it as a conversation than, than uh, talking directly. Ready? And if you'll join us as we sing our closing hymn, but also remember the altar is open for those of you that would like to come and Relieve yourself of your burdens to the Lord. Please stand. Is it a sure? my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight, visions of rapture now burst on my side. Angels descending, bring from above, echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior. Praising my Savior long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I and my Savior are happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above. Filled with His goodness, lost in His love. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior day long. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Amen. Close. She was asked late in her life if she could be healed, would she, would she go along with a new medical procedure if it could heal her eyes? She said no, because she was looking forward to the first person she would see would be Jesus in heaven. Lost in his love. The love of God gives us hope. Hope for today and hope for tomorrow. Hear now the words of the benediction. Go forth in peace. And the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God. And the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever.